Um, thank you so much for um, coming today, and thank you so much for the honor of um, having me here, Isabel. Um, I'm delighted today to uh, be chairing uh, a panel <laughs> with uh, four of my favorite people um, who really have made uh, such a huge gift to all of us uh, and made um, such admirable work to, um, to both help us and also to, um, to, sh to show the way. Um, so, uh, it's sometimes said that to uh, a person with a hammer, uh, the whole world looks like a nail. And this, this may be true. What's interesting though is actually there are very slight and subtle differences between hammers that that's actually allow them to do very different things, some better than others in different ways. And so um, part of, I think, the objective of, of this sort of panel today is to suss out some of the different um, ways in which the different environments that these gentlemen represent and have helped create um, sort of operate culturally and um, have different kinds of communities of use and different kinds of vernaculars of use, different idioms. Um, at the same time, how, uh, how common their approaches are and, and how, sort of how much of a loving gift their work is to, to so many of us. Um, we have here today... Uh, the four founders or lead developers of basically the four main environments in which interactive art and des computational design are done today. Max, MSP, Jitter, Processing, Open Frameworks, and Cinder. Um, I've organized um, their presentations today in chronological order that the, these environments were initially created. Uh, so Max MSP was first released in some version in 1986 or thereabouts, processing released by Casey Reese and Ben Fry in about 2001. Um, open Frameworks, uh, the earliest version on my hard drive I could find was 2005, and, um, uh, and 2010 was when, was when Cinder was released. Um, the last time a, a panel like this was assembled, to the best of my knowledge, was at a conference I organized in 2009 called Art and Code, and Cinder didn't even exist at the time. So it's, it's a pleasure to sort of see how things have changed in the last uh, several years. All of the gentlemen here are extremely accomplished artists uh, and creators and engineers and sort of often called creative technologists in their own right, whether you um, call them artists or designers. Uh, their work is itself quite interesting and I think we're going to see, especially in the, in the panel discussion afterwards, some of the ways in which um, the environments they've developed the environments they've developed to help us make our work uh, are actually in response to some of the, way, the ways that they've needed to develop them to make their own work. Um, I'm going to read each of their bios before they each speak, so I'll begin with Luc Dubois, who is the co-author of Jitter, uh, a software suite for the real-time manipulation of matrix data, developed by San Francisco-based software company Cycling74. Uh, Luke is also a prolific composer, artist, and performer. In 25 albums and numerous other works, Luke explores the temporal, verbal, and visual structures of cultural and personal ephemera. He holds a doctorate in music composition from Columbia University and has lectured and taught worldwide on interactive sound and video performance. He's presently the director of the Brooklyn Experimental Media Center at the Polytechnic Institute of NYU, and he's on the board of directors of the Issue Project Room. Ladies and gentlemen, Luke Dubois. All right. Okay, Max in six minutes, here we go. Um, so it's really hard to talk about um, this piece of software without talking about the person it's named after. Uh, Max Matthews, who passed away last year at the age of 84, uh, was an engineer at Bell Labs in the 1950s and was tasked with the um, incredible job of figuring out how to make sound on the computer. Um, his research, which lasted pretty much up until the weekend he left us, um, created a lot of the foundational technologies and not only um, everything from MP3 players to you know, how we make synthesizers to um, how we work with real-time media today. Max, the program um, had its origins in Paris. Uh, you're looking at an aerial view of another great art museum, the Pompidou Center. Um, one thing to think about next time you're in Paris, at the Pompidou Center is to think about how underneath your feet and behind you um, is the world's largest electronic music research facility. It's called EARCOM. Uh, in the 1980s, they retained an American engineer named Miller Puckett, MSP, to develop um, a software package to empower engineers and musicians and composers to work with real-time sound. Uh, Unlike um, my esteemed colleagues at the table uh, who will be showing their software, this is a 
programming language that you learn a little bit more like a foreign language. Um, it's a bunch of objects and you hook them up and it does stuff. Okay. Um, the sort of classic example is this. This is called the random atonal crap patch. <laughs> um, pretty much everybody knows how to make this within um, about half an hour of learning max. You can see how it works. You've got a bunch of objects and they hook up and they send messages to one another. Maybe a slicker demo might be something like this. This is something that's going to listen to my voice. <laughs> right. Um, and it's transcoding audio into a 3D rendering. Uh, I'm going to do a quick whirlwind tour of some people who use this software. Um, the people who um, sort of started out using this software, as you can might imagine, are musicians. Um, this is the incomparable Pamela Z, um, who is performing with a Max patch that takes her voice, remixes it, loops it behind her, adds effects. Um, a little shout out to Pittsburgh. Um, this is Eric Singer. Eric Singer is a roboticist. He runs a thing called the League of Electronic Musical Urban Robots. Um, this is a mechanical guitar um, that is being driven by a Max patch. Um, Tony Dove, who is um, a New York uh, filmmaker, performs her films live on stage through the act of uh, performative editing. So she'll shoot a movie and then um, use a motion capture instrument. And by waving her arms and making different gestures, she can cut between different scenes of film. Um, Anna Weisling is a um, uh, Northern Ireland-based uh, live visualist who um, remixes live video on stage. Um, this is a pretty common practice these days, but um, this is a sort of typical thing you would do with this software. And then you get into slightly weirder things. Um, Matthew Ritchie's sculpture, The Morning Line, is a massive touring public installation um, made up of a large uh, iron grill work with multiple projection systems and 196 speakers. It, per it plays a never-ending, generative, seven-day-long curated program of music, multi-channel sound, um, developed by the artist in conjunction with um, the Birmingham Electroacoustic Studio in England. Roxy Payne uses Max Patches to make his sculptures. Um, this is a Max Patch that's controlling um, an emulsion engine that's generating these, these, these pieces on a conveyor belt. And then we have my buddy, Dido Manabe. Don't try this at home. Um, this is a man who connects electrodes to his face, connects them to music engines, and uses it to create um, kinetic performative works. Mm -hmm. using involuntary stimulation. Um, all right, one and a half minutes left. I do some fun stuff with Max. Um, I perform. Um, this is with my band in the 1990s. This is with uh, Leslie Flanagan on this very stage a couple years ago. This is with a dance company in Providence, Rhode Island. I also use Max to make um, fixed media works. So, um, for example, this is a 72-hour long film of a performance on Union Square in 2007 that we time accelerated to last for 72 minutes. Uh, this is a project that I did last October in New Orleans, Louisiana as the opening ceremonies for the Prospect Biennial. I had 350 high school musicians in five different locations converge on a park and made a series of remix videos. This is a piece that I did really recently involving um, doing portraiture of classical musicians using high-speed photography, 300 frame a second photography. So you do a four-minute piece of music that lasts for, um, well, 40 minutes. Um, I also make sculptures and whatnot. This piece is up in Dumbo right now at the Dumbo Arts Festival. This was a commission for the 2008 Democratic National Convention. These are eye charts made out of presidential speeches. These are the 66 most common words in George W. Bush's State of the Union addresses. This is George Washington. The piece is called Hindsight is Always 2020, and it's a monumental sculpture of light boxes. Um, the sequel to that, which I also made in Max, was I, uh, I joined 21 different online dating sites and downloaded 19 million people and sorted them by zip code. So I can tell you how many people in your zip code are shy. Um, I then proceeded to scan a Rand McNally road atlas and replace all the names of the cities with the word people use the most in that city. So this is the Puget Sound area. Um, um, I have obsessive compulsive disorder. This is something you, you do when you have, this is New York City. So we are somewhere around here, I think. Um, 
which I think is interesting. The project is called A More Perfect Union. Um, so that is my whirlwind tour of this stuff. Oh, I ran 30 seconds over, good grief. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, Luke. Luke is, um, L Luke is the only one of the gentlemen today who um, actually made his presentation in <laughs> Max, in his own environment. And I, I, uh, I think we've all actually been there where we like think to ourselves, God damn it, PowerPoint sucks, I'm gonna make it myself. Um, but I, I think I would have had a revolt if I'd asked them all to do it. Um, so next up is Dan Schiffman, uh, who works as an assistant arts professor at the Interactive Telecommunications Program, ITP, at NYU. He's a key contributor to processing, an open source programming language and environment for people who want to create images, animations, and interactions. Um, Dan develops tutorials, examples, and libraries for processing, and he's also the founder of the new Processing Foundation. He's the author of several influential textbooks on programming for artists, including Learning Processing, a key text for, for, for beginners, and The Nature of Code, self-published via Kickstarter, which is a new book about simulating natural phenomena in processing. Dan. All right. Uh, hello. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm super honored to be here. I'm, I have to admit, I'm slightly terrified because I've watched Ben and Casey present about processing so many times. I spent, I was saying earlier that I spent about six hours worrying about the alignment of my fonts on this presentation, and I, which I never <laughs> ever do, but in representing processing. Uh, but here we go. So I, I just want to very quickly, obviously, in just five or six minutes, give you an overview, show you what is processing, what are the really basic elements of processing, and then what are some projects that people are making with processing today. Um, one thing I will mention that Golan just referred to is that just this year, processing was founded by Ben Fry and Casey Reese in 2001. I came to the project maybe in around 2003 or 2004. And just this year, we incorporated as a not-for-profit, which is um, something we're doing to look into different ways of raising money to ensure the future development of processing. So processing recently uh, came up with a mission statement. I can't take credit for this, but I will read it to you. Um, processing seeks to ruin the careers of talented designers by tempting them away from their usual tools and into the world of programming and computation. Similarly, the project is designed to turn engineers and computer scientists to less gainful employment as artists and designers. <laughs> so. good, good luck, everyone. Okay. Uh, okay, so processing, there's a big history uh, behind, be, that came before processing and a, a big... Lots of stuff that's ha happened after processing. So there's this big ecosystem of different programming languages and environments. I want to mention just a couple things. Uh, processing was really an outgrowth of design by numbers. Um, but one of the innovations here is that it uses the Java programming language as its kind of underbelly. And so it, it's very extendable through libraries. And anything you can do in Java, you can also do in processing. There's been some outgrowths now with processing.js, which allows you to publish a wide, for a, a majority of the stuff that you make in processing, maybe a minority, but a portion of the stuff you make in processing directly into JavaScript, um, as well as publish uh, directly to an Android phone. Um, processing is used quite a bit for education, and this, uh, this is a little bit of an old graph, um, but this is showing uh, processing usage uh, data, and you can see where the end of the semesters are, and then where winter break <laughs> is. Uh, and it's been steadily increasing over the years. There's lots of books on processing. If you're looking to where can I get started learning, uh, I think the first book came out around 2007 or 2008, and this is just a small selection of some that are out now. Um, so one of the things about processing that makes it great for education is its simplicity when you're first starting. This is processing. That's the IDE. It's just this nice, you know, I, I find that to be very comforting and soothing. So um, it's just this nice empty window. You can get started right away. You can type a little bit of code. You can press this button called run. Your code is compiled. It's executed. Boom, you have your window with your little drawing. So this is one of the things you can do very, very quickly. When you're first learning processing, you can learn a few basic functions, a few basic commands, and be up and drawing really quickly. And this is a sample just from my class this semester of the students learning after you know, one week of the basics of processing. These are some of the drawings that they came up with from uh, uh, a jailed Bear to Kanye West. Okay, so um, uh, a semester can be built. A semester about learning to program can be built with processing. This is a table of contents from Casey and Ben's book, The Processing Handbook, I believe it's called. And you can see how you might build a semester from topic to topic, the fundamentals of programming through different types of modes of interaction uh, and advanced graphics techniques. Um, there are a slew of examples that come with processing. If you download it from very basic things with mouse interaction, um, to, uh, th this is gonna go much slower than I wanna talk, but there's to uh, modeling things with math, a sine wave, 
texturing with images. Um, so the examples are organized as under basics for learning the basics of programming, topics for different types of topics like simulation, image processing, as well as um, lots of other stuff that's in there. And I, I want to keep moving here. One of the great things about processing is that the project itself is rather small. There's a core set, there's an IDE, there's a core set of drawing functionality, but it's extendable. If, you ever, if you're sitting there working on processing and you say, oh, I only wish it did this thing, chances are somebody else thought of that and made a library for processing, and if they didn't, there you go. You can make that library for processing yourself. So there are a wide variety of libraries that exist for processing in 3D, animation, computer vision, if you want to hook up OpenCV, hardware, um, if you want to play with video, if you want to do um, simulation, lots and lots of stuff that you can do with processing. Um, okay, so uh, I think I have about a minute and a half left, so I'm going to run through a selection of projects in a few different areas that have been made with processing. One of the things that becomes a little bit confusing in a presentation like this is it starts to look a little bit like a toy environment. You can draw like little pretty bears and pumpkins and flowers and hearts and things, but, um, and, it, and learn the basics of programming, but as you'll see, a wide variety of professional projects and installations are made with processing, in particular with some of the new features that are in Processing 2.0. Um, this is Casey Reese's project called Chronograph, which is a, um, an installation on the New World Symphony building in Miami, all done in processing. Uh, this is a project from one of my courses at ITP called Beluga. The, uh, the, Frank, uh, the ISC building, which is 18th Street and the West Side Highway, has a 120-foot wide video wall, and this is a live performance where dancers are jumping up and down on these trampolines and affecting these wave patterns on the screen. Um, this is a project called Belly Full of Eels uh, by Molly Schwartz. And one of the things I wanted to point out with this project is Molly is an animator and motion graphics designer. A lot of this project was made with After Effects, but she created these eel animations in processing and then brought them in. So processing is a great environment for taking something, bringing it into After Effects, printing it, building a physical structure. There's lots of ways you can um, come out of processing. Um, data representation is uh, certainly a field that a lot of people use processing for. Um, this is from uh, Ben Fry's firm, Fathom, a project called Density about the world population as it uh, passed seven billion, right? I think we're at seven billion now. Maybe we're close to eight now. I don't know. It's moving very quickly, I hear. Um, this is a project called Cascade, which is by the New York Times Research Lab, which uh, demonstrates ways that uh, ideas propagate through social media. So what happens to a New York Times article after it's been published? Um, this is a project by Nicholas Felton. He makes these every year, or every other year, the, uh, the, uh, the, his annual reports. And he does a lot of us. Uh, um, tracking of his own data and uses processing to generate some of his illustrations and art that go into his annual reports. Uh, there's a lot of projects made with physical interaction. This is a, um, a project where uh, 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 a Kinect camera is, is, is measuring the, the depth map of sand and, and you're able to play in the sand. Uh, this is a project by Filippo Venucci called Scrollables, a kind of pre-iPad uh, touchscreen with actual physical paper that you can scroll and all the graphics were done mm. with processing. Uh, fabrication, this is a project by Mary Huang where uh, you could where a dress was designed, the geometry of a dress was designed using processing, and then the dress was fabricated. Uh, this is a project where um, the human lung was modeled and then a big physical structure. And I'm at the end now, and this is a, this is a project of, um, uh, of a set of prints that are made from processing as well. So uh, there's processing.js, that project can be published to the web. This is a great example of that. And um, I'm going to show you that processing also runs on an Android. And just sort of finish off by saying, <laughs> uh, if, um, if you're interested, uh, there's a lot of new features in Processing 2.0, and you can download it at that link below. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, Many of the environments that are presented here today are, are free and open source, and it's something that, that you can all get started with. But where are my manners? How many of you um, create your own new culture in, in processing Macs, Open Frameworks, or Cinder? A good number. That's great. Um, the, the rest, this is, this is your, your, your chance to learn about them. The um, uh, next person I'd like to introduce, uh, a frequent collaborator of mine, uh, Zachary Lieberman is the co-founder of Open Frameworks, an open source C++ toolkit for creative coding. Zach is also an award-winning artist with uh, a simple goal. He wants you surprised. 
He's, his work uses technology in a playful way to break down the fragile boundary between the visible and the invisible. Most recently, he launched 400 balloons, radio-controlled glowing balloons, across the United Kingdom. He helped create visuals for the facade of the new Ars Electronica Museum. He wrote software for an augmented reality magic trick, and he helped develop an open-source eye tracker to help a paralyzed graffiti artist draw once again. He teaches at the Parsons School of Design. Ladies and gentlemen, Zach Lieberman. So um, I'm going to, I'm super honored to be here and honored to be on this panel. Um, I'm going to use some of my precious seconds to um, describe, um, you know, I was on the, on the taxi ride over here, I was trying to think, okay, what is the best way to describe the open frameworks community? And I was thinking, you know, in high school, what would we be like? And, you know, of course you have like the athletic people, you have the, the nerds. But I was thinking, okay, open frameworks, it feels a little bit like the theater group. And because the theater group, there's always, there's always building stuff, they're backstage, and then there's always some people in the theater group that have the keys, and they have the keys that take you, you know, to the, to the basement or to the roof or to the behind the places you're not supposed to go. And Open Frameworks, to me, feels like a community of people that have the keys to take you to places you are not supposed to go. Um, and, and our motto is, is this, you do not need a computer science degree to do crazy computational stuff. And what we're really built around is this philosophy, this philosophy which is that it's not as hard as it looks, and here's how. I'm going to show you some, some eye candy. This is some, some projects people have made with Open Frameworks. Some Memo Atkin. This is Random International, Chris O'Shea, Arturo Castro, Evan Roth, and Chris Segru. Aircord. Uh, Todd Vanderlyn. Um, Kyle McDonald. Bill Keys. Bill Keys. Uh, Philip, uh, the iWriter Project. Um, Kyle McDonald, Face Shift. Um, structured Light Scanning, 3D Scanning. Um, a lot of music videos. Um, June, Chris O'Shea, Emily Gobiel and Theo Watson, Carolina Savecki and James George, Marshall, Kyle McDonald, Eloy, Yes, Yes, No. There are six key. Um, yeah, yeah. There are six key key things to open firmer. The key key ideas, key key goals. Um, simplicity and the basic ideas that were the open firmer toolkits, like um, a set of small building blocks, small pieces that you can put together, that you can mix together to make things. Um, and uh, and we're really um, designed with this idea that you don't need to. It's a, it's written in C but we want it to be like, you don't need to read all the C++ books in the bookstore, just the intro ones. Um, it's intuitive, and we want to make it just like if you're coming from another toolkit or another platform that it's really easy, um, that it works on the, operates on the principle of least surprise. It's distributed. Um, I love looking at our network graph on GitHub. It looks like some alien music score. Um, and it's distributed also like Theo, um, Arturo and I are, are the core developers, but now there's a group of 14 amazing individuals that are taking on the role of, of managing 3D and iOS and sound and, and, uh, and video and so on. It's cross-platform, so the code you write in Open Frameworks can work on OS X and Windows and Linux, iOS and Android. It also, there's a whole movement now to get it working on Raspberry Pi and Embedded. And of course, the playbook and the touchpad. So if you bought a touchpad for 100 bucks when they were closing out, now you know what to do with it. Um, it's powerful. We wrap libraries that are um, useful, like OpenCV and, and OpenGL in a kind of straightforward way. And it's also extensible. And um, nothing shows that more than OFX add-ons, which is the collection of libraries. Um, these are all of the libraries that people have written you know, that, that extend open frameworks. And last night, I, like a maniac, I tried to download every single one. And there are 650, and it will kill your hard drive. And, and what's amazing is that there's 25 times the amount, the lines of code, there's 25 times the amount of code in open frameworks in the add-ons. And that's just how big it is. Something that I think is really amazing about the work that people do with it is that 
to me, it feels like so many of the projects are, are poems and not demos. They're not about technology. They're about poetry. I'm gonna show you some of my favorite projects really quickly. This is Theo and I in front of a project that he helped create called Laser Tag, which combines a projector, a camera, software written in open frameworks that, that tracks um, these really bright, illegal lasers and allows you to draw on a building. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, the lasers what you have. And allows you to do things like this. Um, and, you know, of course, one of the things that I love is going on Vimeo and just seeing all of the great work that people do. This is a project by Chris Segru, which is called Delicate Boundaries. And here you can see there are bugs on a screen. And when people, the audience members, put their hands next to the screen, you can see the bugs actually come off of the screen onto your hands. So we always talk about artwork leaving the screen, and this is a really good example. Um, Daito, who was mentioned, um, and, and I worked work to, together. This is some extremely weird stuff we were doing in a hotel lobby in Belgrade. Um, this is a, a project which I love, and Carolina's here. She's going to talk to you later today. Um, a project called Sniff, and this is using open frameworks to do the, the tracking and using Unity to, to present this really beautiful um, this illustration of, of a dog that's following your movements and responding to you. And, uh, and it's really magic. It's about creating magic. Um, uh, so many, uh, okay, I'm going to skip everything, and I'm going to talk about what it's why it's important. People say, why are you interested in open source? If you tell people that you're making art, they think of the solitary genius who's misunderstood, working alone in an attic. I think we need to fight against that, that art is a laboratory, that it's a kind of R&D. DIY, of course, we're into DIWO, do it with others. We do all kinds of events and workshops and, and so on. I think if you have a group, you have to have a gang sign. So Open Frameworks has a gang sign. This is the OF, <laughs> OF gang sign. Everybody gets it except for her. Um, and, and we do all kinds of things like make laboratories. This was a laboratory that we made. Um, and, uh, and we come together. We like to write code and drink beer um, and come together, make projects. And uh, most important thing I would say is this, that it's about the community. And so if you're, if you're part of Open Frameworks, I'm super honored to be working with you. And if you're not a part, we, we welcome you. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Next up is Andrew Bell. Andrew Bell is a co-founding co uh, founding co-creator of Cinder, a community developed free and open source library for professional quality creative coding in C++. As a co-author of Cinder, he's both proud and humbled to be helping makers all over the world produce amazing code-driven creative work. He has an extensive background in visual effects and computer science, including stints at The Mill, Adobe, and DigiFX. He's currently employed as a technology research fellow for the Barbarian Group, where his labors are open sourced and focused on, on making Cinder the most potent creative coding framework on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Bell. Hey, so I'm going to just rip through uh, this sort of whirlwind tour of Cinder. Uh, probably a good way to think of Cinder is if you took the processing mission statement and inverted it. Uh, you would end up with Cinder. So uh, we have kind of a disproportionate number of users that are professionals working in creative coding. Uh, they're not necessarily well known in their own right uh, because there's, it's maybe not about their persona as artists. Uh, but I'm going to show some work primarily. Uh, sort of the reasons that people pick Cinder, uh, I'm not going to get too in-depth. They're pretty uh, technical for the most part. And if you would like to, we can... Uh, rub nerd antennae together after I speak. Uh, I'll be happy to, to kind of uh, get full frontal nerdity with y'all. Uh, but for now, uh, we're just gonna just look at, I'm kind of focused on the commercial side. Uh, Cinder gets used for a number of other things as well, but, but primarily this is commercial work. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, a company called Field. Um, they're based in London. Uh, they do a lot of, of really nice immersive installations. This is one they did um, at La Gate, um, that was real-time generative creatures all created in this totally immersive room. I'm also going to butcher every one of these clips, so if you get emotionally involved, get ready to have your heart broken, because I'm going to have to cut them all short. Heart, 
break, sorry. Uh, Brand New School is a shop here in, in LA in New York. Um, they are a really talented animation company. Um, they used Center to build this, um, it's called a Center for Total Health for Kaiser. Uh, so it's all of these uh, really large scale touch screens uh, with sort of health education. Uh, you can go see this in uh, Washington DC. Another really interesting company is a company called Bloom uh, that's out in SF. That Their kind of mission statement is to bring sort of a video game quality aesthetic to information viz. So uh, this is a, an iPad app they built in Center called Planetary um, that allows you to sort of explore your music collection um, through this sort of uh, galactic metaphor. Um, and that's, that's free in the Apple Store. Um, Firstborn is another really talented um, sort of interactive agency um, here in New York. Um, they did, uh, they've done a number of things, but one of my favorites is this uh, tool called DMesh. So it's, um, it's also in the, in the Mac store, you can download it, and it is a sort of abstract drawing tool um, built in Cinder. Um, I know it got used in Prepro on Avengers and some other places as well. I mean, that exports vector output, um, so you can do prints and that sort of thing with it. Art break. Uh, Murata um, is Guillermo del Toro's sort of connected animation company out in LA. Um, they did a really nice project. Probably some of you all saw this um, at the Lincoln Center. This was up for a while uh, for IBM, um, sort of exploring. Uh, this is real time data viz um, done on this huge screen that was running day and night for, for a while um, there at the Lincoln Center. It was a really nice result as well. Uh, let's see, interesting project at uh, MIT um, using Center. This is called um, Tether, and this is a sort of next-gen uh, human-computer interaction research project. So this iPad is um, sort of a window into a virtual space, and then that glove, of course, allows you to interact with that space uh, in real time. Pretty interesting stuff. Uh, one of our many European users is this company Collision, uh, who are Danish, I believe, so they built this installation um, for Audi. Um, I forget which trade show this was at, but you can see this sort of interactive floor. Uh, here are some Danes discussing why advertising is important. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Another European company, uh, iPhonetain, is a Dutch company. They built this uh, multi-touch sort of map um, that's installed at the Groninger Museum uh, that allows you to explore the space in 3D as well as the collection. Uh, who knows what that says. Uh, another well-known company, Radical Media, is using Cinder. Um, they do commercials and music videos, films that you would recognize. Uh, but they're getting into installation work as well. This is um, a project they did for Nike. I, I wish I could run this whole clip, but um, this was at South By, if any of you were there. Um, and it was introducing the fuel band. Um, so they built some, some large scale sort of uh, real time displays all using Center that are pretty slick. Uh, and what, sorry, Google it, you'll love it. Uh, Pentagram is a very famous design company. Uh, they're most famous, I think, probably for their logo design. Uh, in fact, they designed the Guggenheim's logo. Uh, but uh, they also do some really lovely um, installation work, uh, exhibit design in particular. Uh, so Savannah College of Art and Design hired them to build this uh, multi-touch table there at SCAD. Um, that's all done in Cinder as well. Um, if you all know Oblong, uh, this is the company that was sort of the real minority report. They were hired to do all the, the consultation around the tech behind uh, minority reports. So they build these truly next-gen sort of HCI projects. And this is when they just released in Center that is a sort of gestural um, beat creation um, tool that's pretty slick. Um, Breakfast is a pretty cool company here in New York uh, that does uh, physical installation as well. Um, they built, if you all know those electromagnetic dot displays that are like, you know, traffic six miles or zombies ahead, uh, they got an electronics guy to hack that and run it at like 100 uh, times what it was designed to run at and built this real-time electromagnetic dot display. That guy's probably talking about how important advertising is too. Uh, <laughs> Fathom is Ben Fry's company, so Ben's one of the main developers of processing the framework Dan presented, but um, 
for this commercial project for GE, Fathom used Cinder to create the iPad app. This is actually really wonderful. This is the whole history of GE's annual reports, which are actually really beautiful documents, sort of the history of graphic design. Um, and you can play with all of them right there on your iPad, um, and that's also in the Apple Store. Uh, and then my last piece is this, this company, Red Paper Heart, um, does really great installation work here in Brooklyn as well. I can't show you this piece, I don't have time. That's for Urban Daddy's Christmas Party real-time uh, grandfather clock. This is for Nike, though. They did this with Hush. These are these crazy futuristic treadmills that can give you live feedback um, as they're running. This is my very last little piece here. So they built this race. Also worth a Google. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Luke, Dan, Zach, and Andrew. Um, so we now have uh, about 20 minutes for a panel discussion. Um, and I, I think we'll probably uh, maybe just warm it up with a few questions that I, I can lob at you guys. And then maybe we'll take some from the, from the, 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 the uh, the hordes and see what they see what they can lob at you. Um, uh, I guess um, one question I have is is to the what's the extent to which you're developing the the things you do um, as, as a function of you know helping your helping propel your own work uh, versus something you sort of you you say I need, I know the community wants this and I, I, I it's like a, a something a service you're providing. To, to sort of the, the extent to which your own art and research propel your contributions to the environment that you're working on. I probably have the weirdest answer, uh, which is these days not at all. Uh, so, so I get paid full time by the Barbarian Group to just write Cinder itself, which has not always been the case, but is right now. Uh, so I, I have a kind of always the bridesmaid, never the bride relationship with Cinder mm. right now. Um, with the exception, I'm, I'm doing some nonprofit stuff for Charity Water with some friends from church. But other than that, I pretty literally just write Cinder. But again, that's kind of a new development. Luke, I mean, I think the 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 majority of the people who do the engineering at Cycling Seventy Four bring their very much bring their arts practice into the development cycle of the software, but a lot of it's about reaching out to the community and also finding out what, you know, what everybody else wants. I know that when we did the first round of jitter engineering, um, we didn't want to call it like a video toolkit, right? And so they sort of put me in charge of coming up with like all the things that use the same kind of number scheme, but don't have anything to do with video. Right, and that was sort of my dissertation research at Columbia. So in that way, it sort of directly influenced it. But I think um, it's definitely iterative. A lot of times, I see what the guys, come, you know, the, pe the people at the company come up with, and I'm like, oh, I got to use that in a piece, man. I got to figure that. Out. So yeah, it's definitely like that. For me, I mean, one, one thing that happens a lot. I mean, I spend most of my time teaching and writing tutorials. So, and, and at, at ITP, if you're not familiar with the program, we're a, a master's program at NYU at Tisch. Uh, we have about a hundred students who enter the program each fall, learning to program many for the first time with processing. So, a lot of the work that goes into processing comes out of teaching those courses. What are the things the students are trying to do? What are their ideas that aren't being served? What doesn't make sense to them in the way that it's taught and the way that it works in the ID? And so, uh, uh, I, you know, I hope at least try to act a little bit as a bridge between them and, and talking to Casey and Ben and figuring out what's going to be in the API, what are the features going to be, what do we need, that type of thing. I, yeah, I would say in, in my work, but also the work of the, the core developers and the people that are um, really contributing to, to the, the open frameworks code, that it's heavily driven by, it's heavily use driven. So we take the things that we learn when we're making projects and we find a way to make them reusable. And that is, you know, I, I said, you know, I have this big kind of 
pr preach always this idea that artistic practice is research, and you know, obviously, open source is one way of publishing the results of your research. And um, yeah, for you know, for for sure, a lot of the features and the add-ons and the things that make open frameworks what it is and that give it its style or its character come out of the projects that are made with it. So um, one thing that strikes me, um, I, Cycling 74 is a commercial entity. The other, um, the other projects are, are open source. Particularly, uh, actually really in all, in all the different cases, one thing that really strikes me is how small are the teams that make these environments um, and the really disproportionate impact that they have on the landscape of digital art and computational design. Um, so I was kind of curious to see about the extent to which um, community dynamics play, play a role in the creation of your environments. I, I, I think you, you each have a sort of a core set of people who contribute, and then sometimes, especially in the open source environments, this kind of long tail of, of occasional contributors who make a difference in different ways. I wonder if you guys could, could speak about the, the community and the way that that forms and the, your, your projects. Well, <laughs> okay, I'll start. You go first. You go first. <laughs> Um, it's interesting. Like, w one thing that, that I find is that there, there are a lot of misconceptions out there. I think sometimes people will come and ask a question with this sense of that there's this giant building somewhere with the hordes of worker bees all developing, processing day in and day out. And really it's like Ben Fry and is you know, locked into a basement for like one weekend a year or something. So it is a very, very small group of people essentially volunteering their times. Um, the nice thing about the community aspect of this is that there is this very active forum. And, it, uh, and, and, and the libraries as well. So there are people contributing with ideas and making libraries, and a lot of that stuff starts to get folded into the core. I think one of the things we could do a better job at is a more distributed model. Zach showed the, the uh, network graph on Git of open frameworks, and we're, processing's code base is still at, uh, in a subversion repository. So moving in that direction, I think, will really allow more people to contribute in a more substantive way, and that's something that we, that we definitely hope to do. Zach, you want to? I mean, for, for us, the community has always been key, and um, you know, and that, that the community gets driven from a lot of different ways. Obviously, the forum and forums are really active. Um, sometimes the forums are very difficult because they don't always scale very well. Like hundreds of people using them, and it's you know, um, forum software always seems to be really problematic. Um, f forums, mailing list, IRC meetings, meetings in real life, having kind of knitting circle events, having events where we come together, having workshops. Um, and uh, and then increasingly, Git and GitHub have been really important for shaping the conversation of what 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 the tool is. What's and, Git, Zach? Oh, Git. Oh, so Git's a um, a versioning system uh, developed by uh, Linus. Uh, how do you say it? Linus Travolds? Travolds. Travolds. The audience says they it. they know what Git. They know it. I don't. Know. <laughs> um, and the the. Um, the the inventor of, of Linux, or the c kind of key developer of Linux, um, the Linux operating system, and um, developed Git, a versioning system, which has been really instrumental in pushing the conversation to a code level. So instead of just saying, hey, here's a feature I would like, saying, here's a pull request, here is an actual implementation of something that I think is useful, not only to me, but to other people. And we start to have, you know, conversations not go from more kind of, you know, what if or metaphysical questions to like, actually, here is the way you do it. And what do you think about this? And let's talk about the lines of code. And that's been really I mean, that is, that's dramatically changed. So when we started Open Frameworks, it was like zips of code, you know, that we were using FTP. And then, you know, but now to have actually a granular level conversation has been wonderful. Did you want to say? Yeah, sure. I mean, the thing about Max's user community is it's 25 years old and, and growing, and it's actually many communities because it's, it's used in a lot of different ways. The, the, the original um, user group for Max was, were musicians, were electronic musicians. First time I ever saw it was in 1992 the, um, at a visit to the, uh, the um, Dev Theater for the Royal Shakespeare Company. They were using it to procedurally imp implement their lighting design. Right, um, it's used by visual artists. It's used by filmmakers. It's used by all sorts of people. It's used by system engineering firms. A lot of what um, Cycling Seventy Four really works hard to do is try to bring those disparate groups together through the fact that they're all using this wacky software. Right, so we throw like a biannual expo 
where we bring everybody together and we have a very prominent kind of website and community base and that's sort of how we do it. But it's, it's um, you know, there's a permeability between the people who use the software, the people who serve as third party developers for the software and the people who actually work as consultants, consultant engineers for the company. And so there's a lot of flow through that. A lot of times we'll see someone's work self-published online and then we'll hire them to work with us on a version and then sort of rinse, repeat. Andrew, do you want to or, um, talk about the Cinder community? I'll, I'll echo some of uh, Zach and Dan's sentiments. I think we have a similar experience with Cinder. One thing that we do um, is any substantive addition or modification we, we put in the forums for in a re request for comment. So it's a sort of semi-formal mechanism for people to weigh in. Uh, and the designs really do evolve um, through the course of that. I mean, we have a, a ton of professional users and it's a, one of my favorites is a senior researcher at Industrial Light and Magic who's a guy who can and does cite paper like formal papers he's written on these topics as his opinion on the matter uh, <laughs> so and and we have kind of high stakes in the sense that a lot of people are literally earning a living writing center code so they have multi-million dollar projects resting on this so we don't we don't break things lightly and in fact we don't even add things lightly usually there's a pretty sort of a long period where people can weigh in on their, their take on the design. So I got another one last question and then we'll take it to the audience, but, but um, I, we all can understand how the four tools that you guys develop are, uh, are tools to enable research into the production of new culture. And still, there are different cultural sort of emphases or, ex or uh, exponents of the work that's made with your environments. Um, and one interesting contrast is the, the quite evident contrast, I think, uh, or emphasis on education versus production. And it's a perfectly le legitimate and interesting sort of set of emphases. Um, particularly, uh, some, some environments, for example, Processing or Maximus P, have even gone so far as to make their own development environment, make their own user interface to help beginners or to achieve a certain kind of metaphor that, let's say, musicians would find more comfortable than, you know, more familiar uh, as a sort of patch bay metaphor. Um, and uh, so I'm wondering about um, sort of how you, wh where you guys feel about sort of education versus production as a, as a kind of a general theme. And in particularly in light, I'm just curious, curious to the audience, how many of you guys saw the recent uh, fireball lobbed, lobbed towards the, the field by a guy named Brett Victor? No, okay, didn't make it this way. Oh, a couple of you did, okay. Um, well, so, but just in general, but about the education versus, versus sort of production, because each of you, um, are educators in some way, each of your environments are used in educational contexts, and each of you also have people whose livelihoods um, depend on using your products. So we can talk about that. Dan? Go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, I, but I always think of all these good things to say after they go. Anyway. I'll, oh, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Okay, okay Zach. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, you know, it's, I come from a particular bias in that I focus I would say almost all of my energy on using processing to teach beginners. So for me, I like to be involved in processing to make sure that we never lose that. Because it's so tempting. We want to add all this cool OpenGL 2.0 stuff. We want to add all this great new stuff to do with video. And, 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 we would, and in, a, in a fantasy world, processing can really do both. But I think on a certain level, it's really important that we keep that, um, that primary um, that primary sort of principle, the primary philosophy that you can sit down on the first day and kind of feel comfortable and happy and soothed while you're learning to program in a in a step-by-step a -step fashion. So the goal is, I think, um, is, and this is something that comes up in discussion all the time in terms of what to add to the IDE, and that's really related to this Brett Victor thing that came out too. You know, you can use Eclipse to do stuff. There's, Eclipse is a fancy Java development environment. There's lots and, of and Open Frameworks and Cinder both both um, don't have their own development environment. They use commercially available or or sort of hackers tr traditional programmers tools for for developing for writing code. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think Open Frameworks sort of sits hat you know, in the middle between processing and Cinder and that it was, it was designed not as an education tool, but it was designed around education in that it really was um, a toolkit that I was giving students. The sort of history, 2004, 2005, was that it was a tool that was being developed at Parsons, pr primarily because Golan and I, we were collaborating using a tool from MIT that was not open source. Not, not available, yeah. And the, the, a C++ toolkit that it, that also kind of became the inspiration and led up to processing. So we come out of the same family tree in a way, but but this ca came about as a tool for 
for students, for, for me to be able to go to students and say, hey, here are these things that I'm making, you can make them too, it's not hard. That has translated out of the realm of education into uh, obviously commercial work and people making, making a living and making projects you know, with their work, but it, it always feels like it, the foot is in both, both camps, that it's both about education, about making something which is simple and also something which is useful and people can use professionally. Andrew, I wonder if you could comment on education in, 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 for Cinder. It's, it's because um, so so much of the work you showed is you know high end commercial production. Sure, yeah. I mean, I I think it's true of all of these guys. There's a, a God given ability to sort of bring creative coding to the masses. I mean, it's all of these guys are famous. Everyone but me is famous, uh, <laughs> largely for their for both their academic and their art practices of of this sort of Promethean bringing this to the people. Um, it's not really an emphasis, that's true. Uh, Cinder is, I, I gave a talk a while ago called Feeding Babies with Creative Code, and that my passion is people being able to earn a living doing this kind of work and feeding a hypothetical baby. Most of us are socially skillless and would probably never have babies, but uh, should that ever befall you, I would like for you to be able to feed yours. Uh, with creative coding. So truth be told, the, uh, if, you're a, if you're a beginner in this world, I'm pumped that you're getting started. I don't really recommend Cinder if you're just getting rolling though. Luke? I mean, it's funny because Cinder is actually the platform I teach in at school. <laughs> um, and the reason that I do that is because um, the biggest thing about the school where I teach is that the students, um, when, they're, when they graduate, have to have a business plan and be able to incubate a small business career, and so it's the most economically viable kind of situation for that. Max is also used a lot um, in professional kind of systems engineering situations. We use it a lot in education, but one of the things that's a little bit different about Max is you teach things other than Max using Max. So it's used to teach physics in high schools. It's used to teach digital signal processing. It's used to teach music theory. You know, it's used to teach all these other things that don't really actually have anything to do with programming because it's, it's very much like a different kind of language. And so you can't take that kind of skill set of learning how to hook up a bunch of funky boxes and it does stuff and suddenly magically know C++. It's kind of a different understanding. Um, and so it's a way to do an end run around that to still get really creative things out of the computer. We've got um, four minutes, time for one, one or two questions. I see one over there. Sir, why don't you speak loud? Is there a mic? Yeah, there's a mic. Oh, there's a mic, please. Yeah, please, I didn't know. Great, it's great. So hi, my name is Omer. I, I'm a student at ITP. And my question is to the three of you. Actually, to you two. Um, thing is that it's, <laughs> no, because it's like it's you. You, you seem to have solved the problem slightly. Um, the thing that I find really great about um, node-based frameworks, uh, like connecting boxes sort of oh. programming, is that it's really quick to prototype. It's like yeah. seconds to prototype, and that goes for architecture in Rhino and, um, how's it called? Uh, Grasshopper. And, uh, and many kinds of like flame in, in post-production. Thing is, um, I don't see that a lot with, with processing, with any kind of creative coding. I don't think that language is the vernacular. I'm kind of interested in your opinions about how the future of creative coding would look like, if it would be still be text or anything else. Yeah. Thank you. This goes a bit to sort of what Brett Victor was getting at, yeah. and also, also some of the reasons why you see some environments making their own development environments. Um, yeah, it's a great question. So what's, what's the future look like? <laughs> How does it feel? It's supposed to rain. Per, per yeah. Tomorrow's gonna rain. <laughs> I will fall on this grenade. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think it, it's true. Our sort of operating philosophy is we try to make easy things easy and hard things possible. Um, and I think that could be said of OF as well. There, when the node-based tools, I have a VFX background where there's a parallel kind of statement, but the node-based tools have a kind of well-defined upper bound. Uh, and if you hit that upper bound, you're like totally hosed. Uh, and you don't always know what, where your project's gonna sit in the sort of range. So if you can solve it with QC or with any of these node-based tools, you probably ought to. But if you don't know going in where you're trying to get, I don't think we're ever gonna escape these sort of 
full-on uh, programming languages. And, and a parallel question might be, what's the future of video game development? Because in a certain way, what we're up to is not hugely different from video game development. Um, and I think we're always going to want the high end to, to be um, something accessible to us, and you're not going to escape needing to do, to do it the really horrible hard way. I do think one thing that's important also, for me at least, is that some of the very core concepts of computation don't get lost. So uh, it, often when you want to make a project, yeah, you just you figure out, sprinkle some yeah. sauce and like mm -hmm. twirl around twice and make your project, stitch it together and get it done. But there is something really powerful and useful to understanding the basics of computation and an environment like processing. One of the things I often talk about with, my, with the students is, I just want to put a button there. Like, why is it so hard to put a button there? Well, if you need a project with a button, let's figure out an easier way to do that. But actually, it's a really useful process to learn how to program a button from scratch. It might take you all day, and so if someone's paying you a lot of money to get it finished, you might try to do it quicker way. But, and also, if you care about reinventing the idea of a button, you know, learn how to program one from scratch so that you can you know, reinvent that idea itself as well. So I do think that there is a sort of, um, there's something different between what it takes to quickly prototype and what it takes to sort of learn and, and sort of gather some of these core concepts. We've got just half a minute left and I want to respect the, the organizers. Um, are there any parting words that you guys have? Maybe uh, an admonition to the audience or a, or a, 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 chor, a charge to go forth? Yeah, I'm, this is something, because I, I I've noticed a lot of students, some of my students are in the room, there's a lot of students here. From, yeah, that's that rowdy posse programs. we heard earlier. Um, <laughs> and something I always say to students is, the world is hungry for ideas. Yeah. You guys, closing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's good. Yeah. <laughs>